Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. So, Melanie, uh, a few big things happened this week. The first big thing, we'll get to the second big thing in a second, but the first big thing was getting the solar panels back on the roof. Finally. Finally. So, uh, as I mentioned last time, the, we had to take the have them take the panels off the roof back at the end of June so that they could we could have our roof redone because Tesla messed up our roof when they put them up. And so we went all of, basically all of June and all of Jul- July without the panels. And our electric bill, did I tell you what our electric bill in July was? I don't want to know. I'll tell you anyway. It was $600. Wow. Normally, with the panels on the roof in July our bill would be $0. We would actually earn a credit. We'd have several hundred dollars worth of credit on our account. And this year would have been even better because it's been sunny all month. Yeah, Tesla owes us. Yes. Yeah, big one. And they keep saying, well, we adjust the lease payment depending on your, you know, we audit your account. I talked about this last time. Um, I just, again, I'm not convinced that that they were going to adequately compensate us for the last production. So it just drives me crazy. Again, then I'm looking at the production in the first few days and we had one of our biggest solar power production days ever. That first full day, it was back up again. And I'm like, oh, we missed out on so much solar power production. Every, like every every day is, is money, you know, especially when the air conditioner is running, running, running. Anyway, um, maybe this maybe this summer we would have spent so much on air conditioning. It would have been a wash, but it still would have been a lot less. But anyway, I'm glad to have them back on the roof. I'm glad we have a a roof that's brand new. Um, and what's really nice is the the hump that is in, was in the roof. All the all the houses in this development are 70 years old or so. They're just, they're all post war ranch builds, really quick, and they all have this hump uh, that the uh, the contractor pointed out to me, and now I see it on every house where the house connects with the what used to be the garage but in almost every house is now another room and yeah there's like this lump and when they put the panels up originally several years ago they had to arrange them in such a way to avoid the hump but but our contractor took the hump out and now it's a nice even roof and they were able to put the panels back up in a more efficient manner so really really appreciating that so that's good Mm -hmm. the other big thing that happened this week is your birthday Oh, yeah, that was, was kind of big, sort of. <laughs> that was big, yes. So we uh, we don't, we, we, as I mentioned before, we don't make a big deal out of our birthdays. You're, you're in my birthday. Um, we, we'll, we'll always go, you know, have a special meal and we'll always have a cake. Uh, because you always make the birthday cakes around here, you get a special cake. And so we went to the fancy German uh, baker, Konditormeister. Uh, which I think means Mr. Cake in German. Trust me, I don't even look it up. I'm sure that's what it means. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not really, but Mr. okay. Mr. Cake, Mr. Cake, come and get your Mr. Cake. I think that's your slogan. Yeah. So uh, that up. a chocolate chocolate cake with uh, chocolate dipped strawberries on top. It was really good. It's always really good. And it was Lucy's first time trying it. She, until now, she's always been allergic, so... She's this time she was able to have some. Yeah, last year I actually skipped the Konditermeister cake and made my own cake because I was craving carrot cake last year. Right, right. I, I, I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of carrot cake. Your carrot cake is good. Konditermeister <laughs> chocolate chocolate cake is just, man, it is good. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so that was good. And then we also went out for dinner and we went to Wahlburgers. Now, if... If you're not aware of it, you you may have seen the reality TV show about this chain. We've talked about it before. We went there for your birthday last year. Um, yep. So it's a it's a burger restaurant that is run by the Wahlberg brothers, two of whom are movie stars, and they're all from the Boston area. So um, 
your mom was kind of perplexed, like why, you know, pleasantly, she wasn't like criticizing, but she's like, you could have gone out anywhere. Why did you go to Wahlburgers and get a hamburger? Why do you, you like know, Wahlburgers? They just have really good burgers. I mean, they're not like fancy. They're not I don't fancy like, burgers. Yeah. I don't like fancy burgers, really. Honestly, I like just well-made burgers. The buns are good. The The meat is well-cooked. Not too dry, not too moist. Not Very tasty. They don't put them on like potato bro, brioche buns, I think is what they like. You know, they're not, not like frou-frou pub burgers. They're real good burgers. And they have really, really good fried pickles, too. Yes, they do. Every time I talk about their burgers, I, like, I think of Samuel L. Jackson and Pulp Fiction. It is a tasty burger. Mm-hmm. This is a tasty burger. <laughs> um, I really like, I thought of all the fancy restaurants we could go to, and I just couldn't think of any that really was what I was in the mood for, and I was kind of in the mood for a tasty burger. Yeah. Uh, and we, as we've talked about, we're at the stage now where we could be just you and me going out to dinner, but yeah, I was happy with it. That was fine by me. Uh, and plus it's located down in, uh, Hingham in, in, in the, yeah. um, the, the marina. The, right. The, the, the nice, the location, location, location is really nice. Uh, right by the water. Um, so that after we ate our burgers, we went and walked down to the marina and looked at the boats and the sunset. Yep. Saw people doing yogurt. Yoga. <laughs> yoga. Sorry. People doing yoga. Um, yeah, that was that was funny. People you know, in the public doing yoga by the water. And uh, the kids thought that was the funniest thing. You know, people, well, these grown-ups bending in weird ways. Their butt in the air. Um, but yeah, so it was good. We had a, yeah, The kids thought it was funny. Yeah, the kids thought it was funny. Uh, I pointed it out, of course. Like, look at those people with their butt in the air. And they just thought that was funny. So, um... Yeah, that was good. The other, the other thing, so, um, but it's good birthday. Yeah, yeah, it was a good. One. Nice. So the other thing that uh, we did is um, this week I started. Well, last week really I started a new thing with the kids. Uh, I took Sophie out for breakfast, just me and Sophie, and we had a really good talk. And we we talked about, um, you know how how things are going for her and what she wants to do with scouts. And we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, life and maybe what you might want to study or do as a job someday, or, you know, that sort of stuff kind of light, but, but fun. And, you know, I really wanted to connect with her, like just me and her, you know, with this five kids, it's easy for them to kind of just fall into be part of a group, fall into a, a group of, of them. Um, and so I want to really have that opportunity to just spend a little time alone with each one. You get that when you're doing schoolwork with them. Yeah. Cause we end up doing like one-on-one lessons and those often turn into just like chatting and hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so I took her out for breakfast and then, uh, that was last, last week. And then this week, um, I was going to go, going to go get your cake and I asked Nancy to come along. And so we stopped at the mall at the food court for lunch. I asked him what he wanted. And so he wanted uh, the food court sushi. So we stopped there and we had some uh, sushi. He want, he picked out, um, he doesn't like avocado. So none of those avocado rolls, but we had like spicy yellowtail and he wanted miso soup. And we got like a couple of things, like a tuna roll or that sort of thing. And uh, we chatted. I think, I think it's kind of ironic that you went out to for sushi on my birthday. Yes. And didn't actually get me any sushi. No, I didn't. Uh, I was not about to risk putting sushi into a hundred degree car. No. And bring it home no. To you. I, I really prefer not to get food poisoning on my birthday. I just, and I ended up having a very nice lunch when last time my mom came to visit, uh, she brought me some tamales, which we cannot buy here. Nobody sells tamales Nobody in the Boston tamales. area. Well, at least in. Outside of the the big city, yeah, maybe in Boston proper, I could I could find some. Anyway, I haven't found any at any local stores, and so I had stuck them in the freezer, and they were a really nice treat. Mm. I bet you could get them in Quincy somewhere. Quincy has a Hispanic community, large a large Hispanic. I don't know. Well, um, the fun thing with Anthony was that the the conversation it, it takes him a while to warm up to talking one on one. Until you hit on the, the topic, and this is probably true of most 11-year-old boys, until you hit on a topic that interests him. And so we started talking about his his book that he's reading, the book series. Um, 
Alcatraz and the Evil Librarians. Yeah, it's a Brendan Sanderson series. Bra- I haven't read it. Yeah, Brandon Sanderson. And he's just telling me all about it and on. And it was like just very detailed. It was, and I mean, some of us kind of, you know, flying past me, but it was, it was a really good conversation. I think he's being in crowds. I think he's an extrovert and I think that energizes him. Cause then afterward we went for a walk and we walked down to the uh, Newbury comic store to see if we could find something that you would like there. It, it was really just an excuse to kind of walk with him. Um, Newbury comics is sort of a, it's not, it's a, it's sort of a comic book store, but it also has like music and shirts and tchotchkes and hobby game sort of stuff. It's not really a comic shop. Not anymore, despite. really. I mean, it's got lots of graphic novels and manga and, you know, in one corner, but um, yeah, it's a, uh, so anyway, it was nice walking with him and we kind of, you know, people watching and, and chatting about things and it was a really nice time. So I'm going to keep doing this with each of the kids. Um, spending a little time with them one on one like that, and I think that'll be it'll be a nice, especially as they're getting older. It's a nice opportunity for me to keep in touch with them. So, yeah, so that's what we've been doing. Let's talk a little bit about food because so we had your birthday, which we went out for, uh, and then we did have lobster. Where our, our summertime lobster fest, we have lobster basically twice a year, usually Christmas Eve and once in the summer. Uh, so we did have lobster and then I'm trying to think of some other things we had this week. Well, one night was the, the scout uh, cookout, right? Be- it was the orientation for the kids summer, uh, summer camp program. Right. And the Which is coming up this weekend. Yeah. The troop that, uh, the troop that hosts it hosts the summer camp did an orientation cookout. It was just hot dogs and chips. Yeah. No, nothing fancy. Then there was, um, yeah, so it's that. So one night I did make I was gonna make fajitas, steak fajitas on the out on the grill, uh, and I got that all ready. You have to I marinated those for several hours. They uh, they have a really good marinade of um, which is kind of interesting, given that it's a it's a uh, fajita. The marinade is actually pineapple juice, soy sauce, and um, what was the third thing? Uh, let me look it up here quickly. Let's see. Fajitas. Grilled steak fajitas. Uh, pineapple juice, soy sauce, and vegetable oil, and some garlic. Like, garlic is pretty much the only thing in there that I, that says possibly Mexican food to me. But you marinate the it's skirt steak in it, and then uh, you, grill, you, you uh, grill it, and it gets those really great grill marks on it. And it tastes really good. Um, so, but it was going to rain, so I had to improvise did it end up actually any rain falling i think i think maybe like five minutes of rain or something there might have been even maybe a little more than that even though it's uh, been so dry yeah <laughs> so i ended up um well it was it was the thunder it was there was thunder and lightning around so i didn't want to be outside in that um so i ended up getting out the cast iron skillet and doing it there. And it turned out really well. So what you do is you tasty. Yeah. You take the skirt steak and they're usually long skirt steak. And uh, it was, I'd say like 18 inches long and you cut it into six, um, six inch or so uh, you know, uh, pieces. So you cut it into three pieces and then you grill it like that. And then you, when it's done, you cut it against the grain the other way. So you basically have like six inch strips that are cut against the grain. So they're not as chewy to, to eat. And then of course, you know, uh, peppers and onions and tortillas. And you made uh, more Mexican rice and that came out really good. Mm -hmm. And then I made some guacamole and salsa and it was a really good um, dinner. So yeah, you know, we've, we've made these steak fajitas before and they always come out really well on the grill, but, uh, the only downside of cooking them inside in smoke. the cast iron is the smoke. As we mentioned before, we have the worst uh, ventilation in this house ever. And it just, we ended up having to open up all the do- doors and windows and getting the smoke out because it's just, you know, sending out the smoke detectors. Cause it's just, a, it's a pain. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, I would love to be able to cook this in the winter, you know, in, in the house, but then we've got to open up the, doors and windows in the winter. So no, no benefit there. So, uh, that's, that's, I think that's it for food. Um, any other food stuff you made this week? 
It's been a very boring food yeah. week. You did make um, blueberry shrub. I did. Yeah, that was good. Um, we had leftover blueberries that were looking really, really sad, and like, nobody wanted to eat them. I didn't even want to eat them in my most frugal mode. <laughs> uh, but I cooked them up with with uh, some also some really sad looking cherries that were on the way out. And uh, I cooked them up with just some sugar and water. And honestly, you could have just eaten them like that. Right out of the, out of right the pan. Out of the pan. Yeah. Uh, I threw in some, a little bit of lemon, lemon zest in it. And they were good just like that. But so what I ended up doing was you, after you boil them, you strain off the liquid. And I ended up eating the solids with a spoon because they were yummy. <laughs> and then the liquid uh, you mix with vinegar and... That makes it, it keeps for several months in the fridge and you add it to like club soda with ice and you can even add like some alcohol to it and it makes a really nice summertime drink. I've talked about shrubs yeah. before, but yeah, um, this one was, I, I don't know if I've ever done blueberry lemon shrub before and it was really pleasant. Hmm. I made a cocktail. Uh, I made a pineapple tequila cocktail the other day, which was pineapple juice. I had the pineapple juice from the, the fajita marinade. Uh, so I had plenty of that left over. So I decided to have a tequila pineapple cocktail, which was really good. Te tequila, lime, pineapple juice, um, little simple syrup. It was really yummy. So let's talk about things we've been reading and watching. So I finished a book. Woohoo! Woohoo! Uh, this book's called Armored by Mark Greeny. I mentioned it the last time that I was about to finish it, and so I did finish it. Uh, it's the story of this guy who works for a private military contractor. They're a professional bodyguard company, but the high-end sort of uh, well-armed sorts of... Uh, fiction or non-fiction? Fiction. Okay. Sorry, it's a novel. And the book starts with... And he's like a regular Joe. One of the things I like about this is he's not like superhero-level you know, competent. He's not the best in the world. Like, uh, like his other, Mark Greeny's other character that who was in the, the recent Netflix movie, the gray man, you know, he's the best assassin in the world or, uh, Vince Flynn's characters. Um, uh, I forget his name. Um, best in the world. That sort of stuff. This guy is, he's just a regular Joe. Like he's, he's pretty good, you know, he, but he's, uh, he was just in the army, wasn't special forces, that sort of thing. And then when he got out, he started doing this, this uh, private military contractor work. Well, he was, the book starts with him as a, he's working for this company and they're guarding this candidate for president of Lebanon and they get attacked. And I'm, there's not really much of a spoiler. This is the, the opening of the book in the, it's, it's in the uh -huh. advertising. Uh, he gets, he, he saves the future first lady, but he gets grievously injured, ends up losing his foot in the battle, like in the, in the fighting. And so then we leap ahead a couple of years and now he's a mall guard. He's working as a mall cop. Uh, he's got a prosthetic leg. The, his family's really struggling. You know, his wife, who used to be an officer in the, in the army, you know, a, a helicopter pilot is, you know, working nights, cleaning offices, you know, like they're really struggling to make ends meet. And then the opportunity comes up for him to get back into this military style bodyguard work uh, with this company that has a really bad reputation, but it pays really well. And the job is guarding the, this uh, UN peacekeeper delegation that's heading into the the mountains, the Sierra Madre mountains in, Cal in not California, in Mexico to negotiate a uh, ceasefire between some cartels. Okay. And it's do it's doomed from the start. That's really the premise is like the, someone's already planning to attack it, to undermine the negotiations. And so it's an interesting story, kind of the whole way, like nobody knows that he's got this prosthetic foot. And, and so um, he's trying to hide it. And he's also been asked to be a lead team leader, even though he's never done that before. And it's, a, so it's a very interesting story of this guy who's struggling with imposter syndrome a little bit who's trying to live up to, you know, what's expected of him. Um, it was, it, it, there, there's some twists and turns, um, some betrayals. I kind of saw one of them coming, uh, but, uh, you know, you, you might not. It's, it was it was good. I, I, I kind of enjoyed it. Um, Mark Greeny does a good job writing these characters. The wife character actually was 
integral and she actually played a really good part in this and was very interesting. So to have a married couple in this with, they've got kids, you know? And so it's, it was interesting to see the, the inclusion. A lot of these characters are, are single. Like I mentioned this right. before with the Jack Ryan books, like a lot of these characters end up being single and, you know, lone wolves. And this one, he's, you know, he's married. He and his wife have to kind of work together on this. And I, I, I really liked it. It was a good book. I, I, I it's, it said that um, Amazon listed as number one of a series. So I don't know. I have, but I haven't seen Greeny talking about doing uh, more of these. Well, maybe he will. So it'd be interesting to see. It started as an audible original. Did, did I mention that? So it was originally an audio play. Interesting. Yeah. And then they expanded it into a full novel. Huh. So kind of interesting. That's unusual. Yeah. It's different. So uh, then. I, I have not finished any books. You haven't finished any books this no. week. Um, but to, we, we watched today in our Marvel watch with the kids. We watched Black Widow. Uh, I love it. Yeah. It's so fun. <laughs> so Yelena is such a great character. Her. Um, I adore Natasha's Yelena. sister. I, I adore Yelena. Yeah. She is awesome. So in retrospect, having watched Hawkeye, where she shows up, and she's really funny, she's actually funny in this one, too. I guess I just didn't you, realize it. You didn't remember it. I remembered her being funny in this one. Yeah. You, I thought you'd sort of... My memory was of her being much more serious, but there was a lot more quippy... Fun lines. I, I love where she's she tweaks Natasha about her her the pose the pose. Which we like. What Why is, do you do that? What is this pose thing that you do? Why do you do that? Yeah, like you're, you're, you're such a poser. One uh, one arm out, and you do the hair flip as like because you, you know everyone's looking at you. <laughs> so it's so like fourth wall breaking. I I really really love the dynamics, like the family dynamics. It's not a hundred percent believable, given the backstory, like. They were together for three years. Th three in, years. They have, cover. they have this like really fun family dynamic after that. Like it doesn't seem like enough time. On the other hand, I love the dynamic. So I'm not looking at it too closely. Right. Right. Um, it's just really a fun story. Yeah. It's, it's, it's disappointing. Cause I would, uh, that th there aren't going to be any more black widow, um, you know, Natasha Romanoff stories, uh, that that's, that's over. So, uh, I, I, although, I although they could, they could conceivably like do prequels. Like they could. I, I would, in, I would enjoy. Maybe, maybe the actors are getting too old. I would enjoy a movie where we get to actually see uh, Natasha and Clint Barton meet. That would be interesting. That would be a fun movie. Scarlett like, Johansson kind of burned her bridges with Disney, though. Oh, that's too bad. But because yeah. because they they you know they're in Budapest, uh, she and Yelena, and they're talking about like well, this is where we hid out for 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 two weeks for two weeks, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the story of how Natasha defects from Russia to Shield would be a good one. I mean, they kind of I suppose they figure that this movie is sort of filling in that gap by at least having her narrate the story, but you don't see it. She just is telling Yelena about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, I really like the fact, I, I mean, um, David Harbour in this is really great. It's just, he's so funny. Uh, Red Guardian. Well, he, like he yeah. has this idea that he, somehow he's the equivalent, the equal, the nemesis of Captain America, who probably has no idea he exists. <laughs> you know, I was wondering if there might be like, uh, not having, not being a comic book person, but it almost felt like maybe they were trying to. Uh, make reference to a uh, relationship between the two of them that comes from the comic books where, oh, where they, they yeah. do fight. And so this is sort of their way of saying, we're not going to see this in the MCU, but he's going to like have built up in his head, this rivalry, which doesn't actually exist in the MCU, but does exist somewhere. Well, else. Yes. In the comics, he, he was a nemesis to Captain America who was not frozen in ice for the 80s, et cetera. Right. So, yeah, he was there. Um, so I, I was wondering if there was like that, that sort of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge probably. Towards, towards the comics. Yeah, probably was. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, I have to say the, the movie made a lot more sense this time through than it did the first time through where... I, the whole backstory, like, it did not realize that the girl playing Natasha was Natasha on the, the first read. The young girl. The young girl. In the beginning, right. Uh, in fact, 
at first I thought she was a boy with long hair. <laughs> right, right. She's, she's kind of a, a tomboyish character wearing kind of just neutral clothes and her hair just looks kind of shaggy and it just wasn't really clear to me that she wasn't just like a boy with long shaggy hair. Right. I don't know I why she read as little boy as opposed to little girl. And I assumed that mm. the girl who was playing Yelena was Natasha. And yeah, it made a lot more sense knowing who was who <laughs> and how, I, where it was going. I, I, I gather now I can imagine. Um, yeah. So black widow is good. Our right, next up is, um, Shang-Chi in the Ten Rings. Uh, so that'll be our next watch, which will be in two weeks because uh, the kids are going to be at camp. Um, so, and then you watched another movie last night that you've been raving about to me all day. I did. Uh, I watched the Cyrano, which came out, I guess, last year. Yep, the 2021 um, Cyrano with, starring. With Peter Dinklage as Cyrano, um, who was amazing. Yeah. Uh, I did not expect it to be a musical, um, but it was a musical. And I loved the music. In fact, I was playing it tonight and uh, I got Bella hooked. She's been on a musical kick recently and um, she just loves listening to musical soundtracks, which is kind of weird to me because it was never something that I did. But it's a lot of, a lot of teen girls, I guess, <laughs> get into musicals. Anyway, um, it's an adaptation of, I mean, the original Cyrano is a French, was a French play and it's it's been translated into English multiple times and it's been produced as a movie multiple times um there was a Cyrano I remember watching when I was younger oh and then of course I remember seeing uh Steve Martin's Roxanne which is basically a Cyrano story right um, there was the Gerard Depardieu yeah, one that Gerard came out Depardieu. in 1990 yes I totally saw that in the theater I think yeah. uh I loved it this one is different in that they they ditched the nose because Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage has dwarfism. So yeah. So so basically, instead of the nose being the reason, you know, having a gigantic nose being the reason he thinks that Roxanne can't love him, she is. He thinks that she won't love him because uh, he's it's a, a little person. A little person. He's. Um, I felt like this version of the story plays the character of Christian a lot more sympathetically than like the Steve Martin Roxanne did, and I think even more. Even than the Gerard Depardieu, I think that in that one, Christian is kind of a, as I recall, not as sympathetic. Um, mm -hmm. But in Steve Martin, the the Christian character is just, you don't like him. He's, he's kind of a self-absorbed jerk. Yeah, he's a jerk. And in this one, I really thought that Christian was an attractive, sympathetic character. You feel bad for him. And he's not stupid. He just doesn't have a way with words. And he kind of yearns to be something more, to to be gifted in the way that Cyrano is. He admires Cyrano. And I really liked that take on his character. Um, one of the things they, they do that's really interesting is uh, they give the reprise of Roxanne's song, uh, uh, I'd Give Anything for Someone to Say, to Christian. So he sort of sings the song that's an echo of hers, the... I want what you have, um, which really was beautiful. The, the music was great. Uh, the costumes and the sets were amazing. And Peter Dinklage was just. Peter Dinklage is an amazing actor. I like in Game of Thrones. He just, he really stole the show. And, and he, I just, everything I've seen him in, like he's in a role, he's done roles where the character was not written to be, a little person and he he does it, it it just works i mean he's just a really great actor regardless of his appearance uh but this is a role he was literally born to play right i think one of the re reviews i read made a really amazing point which was that other actors who play cyrano take off the prosthetic nose and they go back to you know being their handsome hollywood actor selves Whereas Peter Dinklage is playing in terms of the physicality of the role, he's playing himself. And there's a there's a sort of a pathos there. I mean, I'm sure that anyone who has his condition struggles with issues of, of body image. Like, what do people look at me when, when they see me? Do people judge me? I mean, 
and and he brings all of that with him to the role and he just makes Cyrano such a much more of a tragic character I mean he's always a tragic character but in the versions of Cyrano that I've seen it's played much more for laughs and I feel like Dinklage plays I mean he's funny and he's witty but there's a lot less of the comedy and there's a lot more of the the tragedy um and a lot more of the his personal tragedy is that as he says at the very end um I'm in love with my own pride. I was in love with my own pride. And I really liked the fact that they. He loved his pride more than he loved Roxanne is, is I think is how right. you put it. Um, that, that gave his character so much more, I don't know, depth. It was, it was a fatal flaw because it really became clear at the very end that she would have loved him for himself. She did love him for himself and his unwillingness to speak out deprived both of them of an opportunity. And I just, I felt, I felt like that reading of the, of the play was, was much more profound than I think I've seen other takes on mm. it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very well reviewed. A lot of people, a lot of good reviews for, for it's it. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I didn't see it myself. Uh, you, you watched it without me, but uh, uh, maybe hearing you rave about it, maybe I will watch it because I really do like Peter Dinklage as a, and I do like musicals. So <laughs> I'll have to, have to check it out. I, the, the choreography was really fabulous too. Uh, I have to say uh, there's some scenes where the, the guards are dancing with, with the swords and uh doing drill while singing that was just lovely. There's, there's a scene in the bakery where they're, they're singing and dancing while kneading bread and, and baking it. And there's just a really lovely physicality. That's kind of, it's funny, but it's beautifully choreographed. There's a, some contrasts there. I, I just, it was fun. Apparently they started it as a stage production that he was in. The, the 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 it was the same cast, mm -hmm. and uh, but they did it as a stage production in Connecticut. I'm really glad that they made it into a movie so that more people can see it because yeah. it was really fabulous. I think that's what it was. Is it was it became so big that it they decided, oh, this needs to be a, a movie. <laughs> cool. All right, so uh, that's what we've been reading and watching. Um, let's talk about. Let's talk about the mass readings for this week. Although I have to point out that it was so hot in the church and father was not, well, the readings did not lend themselves to a great homily <laughs> for father this week. Uh, father Willie was the, uh, the, the homilist. I mean, it was a fine homily. It's just, it was, it, it was so hot. It was hard to pay, to pay attention. We did the short readings, uh, thankfully. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is these are some tough readings to kind of convey a lot, but he did have some interesting points to make. Mm -hmm. um, so the the second reading is from Hebrews, and it starts with the uh, well known verses: uh, "Faith is the realization of what is hoped for, and evidence of things not seen." Uh, because of it, the ancients were well attested. That's the New American Bible version, by the frankly. Yeah, which is and Father Willie spent more of his homily talking about that reading than I think he did the gospel. The gospel, yeah. Um, let me give you the a better translation. Actually, of that. Father Willie himself gave us. He said this the lectionary translation is not very good. This, yeah, and he he corrected it. So oh. the 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 Revised Standard Version, which I think is what he based his on, is uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Yeah, Father Willie actually glossed it even further, and he said it's the confident assurance of things hoped for. Yes, I really liked that. It's there's a there's a confidence about faith that it's not just right. Faith is faith is isn't about things you know. Like you don't have faith that gravity will pull the thing in your hand to the floor. That's knowledge. You know that. You, you don't have to have faith in that. It just is. I mean, there might be f a little bit of faith in that it will always be that way. 
I suppose. Um, but it's knowledge. Faith is is belief in something that we can, that we hope for. But it's but it's more. A lot of people treat faith as if it's like a sort of willing suspension of disbelief. No. Whereas whereas I think the the adding the the adjective confident, the confident assurance. When you have faith, you're confident about your belief. It's not just I I hope I hope for. It's that I really truly believe that this is the case. Right. By faith we know we know that heaven exists, that God is with us. We we faith isn't just blind trust. Faith is understanding. It's wisdom. Um so that we have we have um conviction of things and so in Hebrews goes on and gives examples of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham and father kind of expounded on the Abraham Yeah, it's father like, focused mostly on the Abraham example. Yeah. yeah, Abraham by faith obeyed when he was called to go out to to the new place, to head out to the the promised land um that he was to receive as an inheritance. He didn't he didn't know where he was going to go. He didn't know where he was going to settle. He did not know what they would find when they got there. But and, and he left a pretty cushy life in us in, in the city. Right. In a, a sophisticated urban, you know, metropolis. Right. Ur was about as like it was the big city. Yeah, there's a this big city. So he's he's setting off from the big city to Go wander and be a nomad and live in a tent in the middle of nowhere. Yes. And so, but it's, but his faith is based on his knowledge of who God is, his, that God's, tr- God's got a track record, but God, God is true. God, I, you know, I have faith that God is not going, is not calling me to something bad because I know who God is. God has a, has a track record. Um, and so that's the, assur- the assurance, the confident assurance of things hoped for. Because he has faith in God, because he knows who God is, he has a relationship with God, and I think that's part of what faith is about. Faith is about a relationship, right? When you when you when you trust someone, it's kind of about a trusting relationship. When you trust someone, you have faith that they are going to do what they promise, that they're going to keep their word, that that what they say is is trustworthy, right? Like marital fidelity, faithfulness, you know. I, Faithful, I have faith in you. You have faith in me because we know each other. We trust each other. Um, yeah, and it's so. I mean, it, good readings. <laughs> Just it was hard to concentrate on them as uh, as I sweltered in the in the uh, church this morning. Um, the gospel was Jesus uh, talking about um, you know, gird your loins and light your lamps and be like servants who await the master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. I have to, I have to say this one strikes home a little bit because I was <laughs> drowsy throughout mass. I was not necessarily re- uh, ready and awake when this when the master uh, was coming. Um, but I mean, think of it, blessed are those servants who the master finds vigilant on his arrival. You know, I mean, it's it can be hard to be ready to you know, as you live in your life, you do when you think. So what is, what does it mean to be vigilant? God wants us to be ready for when He calls us when he calls us at the end of our lives, when he returns for the second coming, when he calls us to do his will. I mean, all of those things, it's all the different kinds of ways that we're called, just like Abraham was called to leave Ur and head out to the promised land. And it's tough to be ready and to be vigilant because you got bills to pay and work to do and house to maintain and kids to raise. And you're, you're caught up in the minutia of everyday life. So being was, being vigilant and ready is hard. I was talking about that this reading. Well, not so much this reading, but another one with a similar meaning with Sophie this week. And we were talking about like the the whole if you knew when the thief was going to break in, you'd be you'd be ready for them. And that's this reading. Yeah. Yeah, but but it was it was I mean it was from a different gospel. Oh, okay. Similar idea. Yeah. Um, we talked about how like. If you knew that today was your last day, if if you knew that something was going to happen to you, you know, tomorrow and you weren't going to make it, what would you, what would you do? How would you live today if you knew for sure that it was going to be the last? 
And hopefully, I mean, if you were prepared, if you are prepared, if you're being vigilant, it is living every day as if it could be your last, like not putting off. I think there's this famous St. Anthony story about that where, you know, someone asked him while he was in the midst of, I don't know, washing dishes or something. If, if you knew today was your last day, what would you, what would you be doing? Uh, or, and he would, and he said, I'd be washing dishes. Like I, I live every day as if it's my last day. Right. Yeah. That's hard. <laughs> not right not not an easy thing but yeah um, something to keep in mind something to bear in mind and, we, and part of that is, is we shouldn't have to be doing anything like special cool filling you know filling our bucket bucket list you know that that sort of stuff our lives should be taken up with the things that god has called us to do so we should be doing whatever we've been called to do is it for our for each day of our lives until the last one and, you know, die without regrets, die without, you know, saying, oh, I should have, I, I could have. Uh, so in, some food for thought there. Interesting. Uh, Father also spent a lot of time talking about the death of Vin Scully, the uh, Dodgers baseball announcer, who was Catholic, apparently. But uh, I don't really know anything about him, and neither did do you, Melanie. No, I mean, he made, him, he made him sound like... An interesting character. He talked about him as as a lector and um, just. I, I gather he knew him out in L.A. Maybe. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah, he talked about like a pre-game mass, I guess. Which I wasn't sure if Father Willie had been saying the mass or heard about or what. It was unclear. Right. He, F- Father Willie used to be at the um, Family Theater Productions out in Hollywood. That's what he, uh, I think his previous assignment was. So um, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be surprising if he knew some of the more famous Catholics out in California, uh, in Los Angeles. Oh, well, that any case. Sense. Very nice. So uh, let's wrap things up there. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Tristram C., Nate and Jessica V., Daniel B., Aaron W., and Rocco F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. I didn't, I should have previewed a little bit of what we've got coming up this week because we've got uh, my nephew's wedding and we've got Taking the kids to summer camp. So there's a lot going on uh, coming up. So we'll have a lot to talk mm-hmm. about next time. So, but in the meantime, that's it from us. You'll find links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. You can send your feedback at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. You can send an email to bets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Follow Raising the Bets in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at the StarQuest YouTube channel, where you should also make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. Until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy, The Catholics of Oz. Find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash Oz.